This week we're looking at two articles that probably sum up a lot of what occurred that led to double entry being a useful an omnipresent tool and to the expansion of trade finance and all that goes with it between the 13th century and 1800 it also explains what um, happened afterwards in terms of the financial centres use of double entry and use of the financial instruments that had been developed earlier. As a, as a part of the history of accounting, it provides fundamental contextual information that helps accounting historians and others to understand the role of double entry bookkeeping throughout that period. The first of those articles uh, by Jim Bolton and Francesco Guidi Bascoli is quite unique. Unique in that it's easily accessible. Unique in that it compares the entries in a medieval bank's ledgers in two different locations in the same period. So you can actually see both sides of a transaction being recorded. It effectively rewrites the history on the use of bills of exchange and sets double entry within that context in a way that's never been done before. The second article by Peter Spofford charts the way that the financial centres in Europe shifted from place to place. Now this had been done in a broader sense with Fernand Braudel in the 1980s where he charted the, the shift in the centres of commerce primarily. And what Spufford does is effectively starting from the same place as the other paper. We're giving us a different slant on it. The Italians led the way in medieval Europe. They, if you look at the literature, were the only bankers. Certainly on an international scale, they were the only bankers. But if you read very carefully what is in these two papers, it is apparent that the Catalans were, some of them at least, were using double entry bookkeeping whereas the literature on double entry bookkeeping uh, tells us that it was really only the Italians that used it. So you have a lot of extra information in these papers that's coming out, particularly if you read them very carefully. However, the main things that I want to get across with these two is the foundation stone for what led, or what led to the way that um, double entry establish itself and then in later periods the way that we do financial accounting was established based on double entry in these papers you can see quite clearly and it's actually stated in the first that bills of exchange led to the commercial revolution in the 13th century they facilitated it they were what enabled funds to move across Europe and particularly from north to south, or south to north, when there was insufficient coins and bullion to 
maintain trade of any scale. Now we've dealt with this already in this course. It goes back to the invention of double-ended bookkeeping, where that came about, most certainly because of the shortage of, of coins. Insufficient coins and bullion to sustain expansion of trade means the trade does not expand. And trade did expand from the 11th century onwards. And something made that happen. And that something, once it was invented, was double entry bookkeeping. The way that business operated, and you saw that from that earlier paper on the invention of double entry bookkeeping, it came from money changers who became bankers and became fair bankers and then became exchange bankers. And they moved across Europe and facilitated the movement of funds across Europe. And they did so using a bill of exchange and they relied on it to make the whole thing work. Backing it up was a double entry bookkeeping and a trusted network of commercial contacts or correspondence. These three things together enabled international banking led by the Italians and only undertaken by the Italians in medieval Europe to work effectively and efficiently. It wasn't the only thing they used, they also used the letter of advice and you got a very good example in the first paper of that. And the letter of advice allowed transfers between two banks and transfers between accounts of clients. And in order for those to happen, you had book transfers in the ledgers of the banks that operated. So you had double entry bookkeeping still in there. And obviously you used the network of commercial correspondence in there. But this was not the same as a, a bill of exchange. A bill of exchange was very formulaic, um, had rules they are normally viewed as being fairly fixed but in the first paper it's made very clear that in practice and in the bank that they were looking at which was one of the most important banks of its day they were quite flexible really the period of usance which was defined by the Florentines when bills of exchange were first developed theoretically was fixed depending upon a table of usance periods and the usance was the time from the issuing of the bill to its being converted into cash at the other end or into funds at the other end so for example from Venice to London was three months 90 days and that was the usance period so even if the bill arrived in in London after 40 days it wasn't due to be paid until the 90 days were up because that was the period of usance what the first paper shows very clearly is that that was very often waived or extended um, it was more of a guide than a fixed condition of the bill but the letter of advice was much less formulaic. It was very informal. It was just an instruction in a letter to move funds. If you think long enough about bills of exchange and the way they operate, they, they are in theory very, very rigid. And what the letter of advice gave was the ability for the banks to make changes quickly if they wanted. And they could move funds much more rapidly than if someone was applying the, the strict conditions within a bill of exchange with its usance period. And they used them for two main things, the transfers between two banks, which in itself is very, very important. Um, if you got um, a bank in London and another bank in, in Bruges and you want to uh, move funds from one place to the other, you just tell the other bank that you're going to make a creditor in your ledger so therefore it needs to make you a debtor and that's the way that the system worked very very simple and transferred between accounts of clients so basically just moved it around and if you take the letter of advice and, and 
uh, drop it into the, let's say the Fairs of Leon. It's a much simpler way of finishing the clearing process when people wanting funds transfer to another place. Anyway, these were the, 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 the main things uh, concerning bills of exchange and the way the banks worked with the, with the bill of exchange to letter advice. You can see that primarily we're focusing on the banks. The banks were merchants. They didn't change them. They didn't stop considering themselves to be merchants for a very long time. And it was just a, a way of doing business. It was just another business. You're trading, trading good, trading in finance. But they led the commercial world because they facilitated the trade taking place. So their business facilitated the, bus the commercial business of other firms. And if you want to look at the history of accounting in medieval, early modern Europe up to 1800 in other words, you need to look at the banks because they were what made the whole thing work. And we're merchants for example, didn't consider it, it was cost-effective to use double entry and so therefore didn't use it. It was through the bank ledgers that the book transfers took, took place. Now, another thing that happened as a result of the, or that caused the commercial revolution in the 13th century, in fact, what pushed the whole thing into place it was a shift from Italian merchants moving around, of moving around Europe, just staying in one place, and using a network of distant agents, partners, factors, and that brought international banking. And international banking, as we said previously embraced the use of bills of exchange. It developed the bill of exchange in the 13th century. You had the letter de foi that, that by the middle of the 13th century had turned into the bill of exchange. The shift to sedentary merchants from uh, travelling merchants also brought marine insurance because trade was now being done over big distances. Uh, trade that used ships carried risks so it was it was a vital component of international trade it brought the use of double entry bookkeeping to support the use of bills of exchange and if to facilitate the transfer of amounts between different entities or people the requirement for regular courier service across Europe, which can be seen uh, certainly in the middle of the 12th century. And companies with a large number of transferable shares began to appear, which enabled them to be bought and sold. So you had shares trading on early equivalents to stock, stock markets, stock exchanges, particularly in early modern Europe. And Peter Spilfer in his article focusing on the financial centres charted the shift from one centre to another and each of the centres began life as a trade centre or it became prominent as a trade centre before it became a financial centre. The Champagne Fairs was the first he highlights, then Venice and Bruges Venice in the south, Bruges in the north, then Lyon and Antwerp, Lyon in the south, Antwerp in the north, then the consolidation into a s one centre for Europe, Amsterdam, which over time shifted to London, and at the beginning of this century it was still in London, as you read in the article. 
whether it stays there or not is beyond the scope of what we're dealing with. And all of that was possible because of international banking, the use of bills of exchange, and all the things that went with it. It's a very straightforward and relatively easy to follow set of circumstances and devices that led to this situation where trade was expanding, banking expanded because of the trade, merchants became sedentary, they adopted devices that enabled the whole thing to work. So you got the expansion of markets, the growth of capital, and in time, the adoption of financial reporting, because the owners of shares wanted to know what was happening. But until the 19th century, that was not something that was terribly common, because there wasn't a great necessity or need or demand for that knowledge up until then. And that's really it. That's what the two articles tell you. And they're very, very informative and uh, put together. They basically summarise why double entry was very, very important throughout the period from the 13th century to 1800. And without double entry, as you read in the first paper, although you could have used single entry, once the scale got above a certain point, it just wasn't feasible to do so. You needed double entry. And that's why double entry was most certainly used, widely used, in Europe throughout the period up to 1800, up to the 19th century.